Hello, YouTube. It's Eric. Um, this video, this is going to be a part one of a two-part video series. They're going to be a little longer videos. I'm going to be reading to you, um, in this first video, I'm going to be reading to you some great information on the Paraguayan Jesuit reductions. And I'm doing this because underst um, knowledge of these Paraguayan reductions is key because the entire system of modern communism and essentially fascism are modeled off these Paraguayan reductions. You can see that the Jesuits were the complete masters uh, of these reductions. Um, when you understand the Paraguay reductions, you see that the uh, like Jonestown uh, cult community that was created in Guyana by Jesuit undercover Jesuit Jim Jones was like a Jesuit re reduction modeled off the models in Paraguay. Yeah, cause Jim Jones was playing the Jesuit. The, the, the Jesuits actually indoctrinated the Indians into such an extent of mind control that like the Indians uh, and the, the Jesuits made the Indians so superstitious that the Indians viewed the Jesuits as God. Okay, so it's, oh. yeah, so I'm going to show you the book I'm going to be reading out of for this first video. You can get this on the internet for free, but this is the, the, the Jesuits, <clears throat> the complete history of their open and secret proceedings from the foundation of the order to the present time by Theodore Greisinger. Okay, and actually, I found some interesting photos here of the Jesuit reductions, and I'm going to put these up while I'm reading. So here's a, here's an interesting photo I see here. Here's like a, a little stamp here. You see Ignatius Loyola. Um, let's see if I can get this, this zoomed in here. Yeah, there's a stamp here for one of his. Uh, yeah, there, there. I know there was a reduction called uh, Saint Saint Ignatius. Okay, but I'm gonna get to the. So, this is uh, page 127 of Theodore Greisinger's book. Okay. Uh, with the Portuguese, the Jesuits came into Asia with the same people they also came into Africa, and still again, the Jesuits came with them into America. In the last mentioned quarter of the globe, that nation already possessed an enormous extent of territory, which is now known under the name of Brazil. And in the year 14, 1549, King John III of Portugal sent a fleet of ships containing a number of emigrants who founded the city of San Salvador in the Gulf of Bahia on the east of the coast of Central America. As the missionary work of Francis Xavier had been so extraordinarily successful among the popu populations of Asia who had thus been converted into good subjects of the king, he requested Loyola, the Jesuit general in Rome, to supply him with some missionaries for America, that is, Portuguese King John III, also in hope that the long-cloaked fathers might get on as well with the inhabitants of the West Indies as they had done with those of the East Indies. And Loyola, at first sight, recognizing the importance of the mission that once consigned to him six members of his order. Those six, among whom was Emmanuel Rodrigo, who by his untiring energy as well as by his superior sagacity, was highly esteemed by Jesuit historians, and not without reason, at once built a house for themselves at San Salvador, that is to say, a residence, and then commenced their efforts in order to see what, what could be effected with the natives in the interior of that country. It was soon apparent, however, that the latter manifested a very difficult disposition from the degraded and inverated Hindus under the oppressions and tortures inflicted on them by Europeans, they, if possible, became still more savage and cruel than they had been previously than they had previously been. The Jesuit fathers, therefore, were not received with anything like a good welcome, and could not, in consequence, do much with them. At all events, at first, as they were not at all acquainted with the language of the Indians, as the natives of America, as the natives of America were commonly called. They lived, moreover, in a constant fear of being murdered by the savages who, being cannibals, entered an irresistible longing for the taste of human flesh. They had so much to endure besides from oppressing during their wanderings that it was indeed surprising that any of them escaped under the circumstances and their zealous efforts. Nevertheless, they soon found their exertions crowned with a certain amount of success as the Indians allowed all the unfortunates who were condemned to be eaten and who were, for the most part, prisoners taken during their constant feuds with other tribes be baptized previous to their being slaughtered. Besides this, they might with some success among their Indian females, at least with those tribes who had pitched their camp in the neighborhood of European settlements and induced the same to accept the rosaries and Agnes Day. Through the women, they obtained some influence too over the men, and the result was that the conversion always terminated with the rite of baptism, although those baptized had not indeed the slightest conception of Christianity. 
The Jesuits at length brought the matter so far that most of the whites in the Portuguese settlements, as well as the half-castes or progeny of whites and Indian women, accepted them as father confessors. <clears throat> the great thing, however, being that they obtained large tracts of extensive territory, that is the Jesuits, in the way of presence in order to build their own residences and colleges. This took place all over the country where it was, uh, where it was at all possible, and there soon flourished in San Salvador, Pernambuco, and Rio de Janeiro, three magnificent and very numerously attended edu educational institutions. That's Jesuit educational institutions. Not long after this, uh, less than 20 years subsequent to their first landing, the Jesuits had already overstepped the boundaries of Brazil and penetrated Peru, where in Lima, La Paz, and Cusco, they had established colleges. Later on, after another 20 years, however, they possessed settlements in every part of the South and Central America, wherever the banners of Portugal or Spain waved, as for the instance in Chile, Mexico, Tucumán, and Maraham, and their agents and missionaries per permeated throughout the whole of that enormous continent, which extended, uh, which extends from the Uthamus of Panama to the Straits of Magellan, as on the other hand, from Panama upwards to the Rio del Nord. They indeed penetrated even into Canada, and the banners of Ignatius proudly waved wherever the white flag with the three lilies protected it. When, however, that country came, into given, uh, came to be given over from the French to the English, the Jesuits had to take their departure and fly perceptibly to the south, as neither, English, as neither the English nor Dutch, and not even the Danes, tolerated uh, Jesuit settlements in their American colony. Okay, I'm just going to change the picture here. Um, <clears throat> here's a... Actually, where was one here? There was one photo of a good old Jesuit reduction. So here's a photo of one here. Here's the Jesuit priests with their Indians and in a reduction in Paraguay. Um, great, however, as was the power and possessions which the Jesuits obtained in individual countries of America, the splendor was almost entirely eclipsed by another grand acquisition which they encompassed in the same land, where they got possession of a complete empire over which they ruled as absolute monarchs a dominion indeed twice as large as Italy. The country was called Paraguay. And since it has never before come to pass that a purely ecclesiastical order has elevated itself to the position of a sovereign king, on that account, it is well worth the trouble going into the matter a little more in detail. Okay, and just going with communism, you see here that this is the, the Jesuits perfected communism in Paraguay. And that's why uh, I think the Soviet Union was like a Jesuit experiment, okay? Um, Joseph Stalin, educated by Jesuits at Tiflis uh, Seminary uh, in Georgia. Okay. Karl Marx, educated by Jesuits. Okay. Lenin was in contact with Pope Pius XII for many years. Okay. There's many similarities, too, between the Jesuits and the Leninists. There's a good, um, you can read, if you know how to use LibGen to get free journals, there's a journal titled The Jesuits and the Leninists. It was published in some uh, sociology magazine, but it's very good. The Leninists and the Jesuits are very similar. Very, they're very similar. Okay. Um, the, continuing here, the Paraguay of the present day, and guys, this book was written in uh, 1865. The Paraguay of the present day, one of the smallest free states of South America, is bounded on the west by the River Paraguay, on the east and north by Brazil, and on the south by the territory of uh, Parana. Having a, that's not a country anymore. <clears throat> having an extent of only 4,175 square miles, the Paraguay, however, of the 16th and 17th centuries was on the contrary in infinitely larger proportions and embraced nearly all the land now included in the states of La Plata and the Banda Oriental. The same corresponds with almost uninterruptedly a large continuous plain, but with a few ranges of hills of not more than a few thousand feet in height and is watered by a number of delightful streams, especially the rivers called Paraguay and Uruguay which discharged themselves entirely into the Panama, which after its union with the Uruguay uh, assumes the name of Rio de la Plata. And just another quick uh, mention on some of the Jesuit connections to communism, and that's why during the prime time of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, American Jesuit Edmund Walsh, who the G Georgetown School of Foreign Service is named the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Edmund Walsh was stationed in Soviet Russia, creating communism. Okay. Um, it's climate <clears throat> it's climate that is Paraguay is semi-tropical. On that account, its soil surpasses in fertility that of almost any other country in the world. Consequently, not only do the ordinary descriptions of fruit which are made of use for food by man thrive and prosper, but also such plants as tobacco, cotton, and sugar can be grown there with advantage. 
<clears throat> of not less importance, but perhaps indeed much more, is the condition of the animal uh, is the condition of the animal creation therein. On the one hand, there are to be found enormous troops of all descriptions of wild animals, such as swine, stags, and different kinds of deer, while on the other, domesticated animals, uh, more especially horses and other cattle, abound in herds. Nothing, however, surpasses the magnificence of the forests and the so-called barrigios of no less than three fathoms in circumference, as also palm trees of 180 feet in height are by no means uncommonly to be met with. In short, is it indeed a wonderfully delightful country being the only region perhaps which can be made available for such opposite uses as it, opposite uses as it happens that enormous tracts during the rainy season disappear underwater. First discoverer of the superb territory was the Spaniard Juan Diaz de Solas, grand pilot of Castile, who in the year 1516 entered into the Rio de la Plata and was, was killed by natives. He was afterwards eaten by them within sight of his ship crews. <laughs> Three years after this, Don Maritain de Sosa, Captain General of Brazil, sent Alexis Garcia, along with four other Portuguese, all brave and powerful men, to the Rio de la Plata in order that they may, might endeavor to penetrate beds into the gold and silver coasts of Peru, which at that time belonged to the Spaniards on this adventurous journey was indeed affected. And this adventurous, adventurous journey was in, indeed affected. On the return journey, Garcia and two of his companions were massacred by the savages, and the two remaining ones succeeded in reaching alive the town of Bahia or San Salvador. The expedition of George Sedano terminated in a result quite as unfortunate. He, with 60 other Portuguese, set out likewise from Bahia for the Piranha, and they also, through the treacherous cunning of the Indians, all found their graves in the same river. At last, the Emperor Charles V, in the year of 1525, sent his grand pilot Cabot, as John Cabot, with five ships to the river of Plate, and this distinguished mariner succeeded in ascending it until he arrived at Paraguay, and consequently, no one but him can be thanked for the first correct information uh, concerning that country. He took possession also of the whole territory of Parana or Paraguay for the Spanish crown, and erected at the conference of the Rio Tesiro with the, pa with the Parana, a town later known afterwards by the name of Cabot's Tower. The first settlement, however, properly so-called, namely the city of Buenos Aires, was only then ten years later was 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 only founded ten years later by Don Pedro de Mendoza, who in 1530, by the order of Charles V, set sail from Seville, also for the Rio de la Plata, with 14 ships and a crew of nearly 30,000 men. And two years after this, at the confluence of Pico de Mayo with the Parana, the city of Assumption, which is situated equidistant from the boundaries of Peru and Brazil was established. From this time forth began the actual appropriation of the country as well as its gradual colonization by the Spaniards and thence arose the vice royalty of La Pata, over which in the name of the king ruled of those so-called uh, ruled one of those so-called Adelantad or captains general. Still after the lapse of some time other cities were again founded as for the instance in the year 1557 Cardinal Real at the junction of the Picrui with the Piranha, and in 1570, Santa Fe on the Rio de Salado. Thus one, must, uh, thus, one must not keep out of the sight that all these settlements lay on the great rivers of the country, while on the, co while on the contrary, not a single colony was established on the mainland. Consequently, they were considerably apart from the several commercial arteries which served instead of roads. On the other hand, the said mainland continued to be quite uncolonized, completely unconquered, and thus thoroughly unknown to the Spaniards, who in the provinces subdued by them, only troubled themselves about to search for gold and silver, and had no desire to know anything concerning agriculture and the breeding of cattle, or indeed industry or trade, proving themselves here, as throughout the whole of America, to have but a bad talent for colonization as the Spaniards. Every one of them who embarked for the America desired only to live like a nobleman, regarding it as a derogatory to engage himself in the slight in the very slightest or uh, so the nobleman regarded it as derogatory to engage himself in labor of the very slightest kind. <laughs> uh, under such circumstances the captains general must very shortly have come to the conclusion that the provinces entrusted to them could never attain any degree of development or arrive at any property or an order unless the natives and the natives of the country the indigenous Indians could be induced to become efficient citizens. These indeed formed but by far the greater majority of the population, and from, from them alone could be obtained their labor, which was wanted most imperatively. <clears throat> and I put another picture up here of the reductions. Um, I don't think that's a reduction photo here. 
Here looks like here's a here's a remnants of a reduction here of the Jesuit mission in Paraguay. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. How then was this desirable object to be accomplished? The answer to this was simply by making Christians of them, that is the Indians, as along with the Christian religion, they would involuntarily also acquire at the same time Christian manners, Christian culture, and a Christian mode of living. Charles V had not the time sufficiently impressed upon the captain's general whom he had sent on Lopata that the ecclesiastics and monks taken with them were intended for the conversion of the native Indians, Neither did Philip II see to this. The captains general, too, were in this respect very remiss in their duty as to the orders they gave. They brought, uh, they brought out to Paraguay, it is true, several Franciscan monks, among them whom Francis Solano and Ludwig de Bolanjos were notably distinguished. Moreover, of the province of Paraguay was given, a bit, uh, was given a bishop in the person of John de Barras, also a Franciscan monk, and the city of Assumption was raised to the sea in which he himself made a solemn entry in the year 1554. He had, however, no great desire to prosecute with vigor the introduction of Christianity for two equal weighty reasons. <clears throat> in the first place, on the account of the behavior of the Spaniards, which displayed the strongest contrast to the teaching of mildness and benevolence indoctrinated by the gospel, as it is notorious with what un unmerciful severity and cruelty the proud and sateable conquerors treated the poor oppressed natives, and in the second place, there was no desire on the part of the latter to embrace the religion acknowledged by their tormentors, as on the contrary, they disliked this religion as much as the Spaniards hated them. And if here and there, in order to escape oppression, they allowed themselves to be baptized, they immediately, as soon as a favorable opportunity presented itself, reverted, reverted to their original faith. Then again, there was a complete uh, dearth of the priests, and there existed whole districts where there was not a single member of the fraternity to be seen, no one to baptize and marry, no one to instruct the young, no one to tender extreme <clears throat> um, unction to the dying on their way to eternity. Should, however, an isolated spot happen to be so fortunate as possess one or at most two ecclesiastics, they are practically of no avail among this vast extent, of ter vast extent of territory. And on account of this want for power, but much more even... Uh, from the circumstance that a few were acquainted with the language of the Indians, it became evident that all attempts to convert the unbelievers must be abandoned. And what whence, uh, and whence arose this great want? Simply from this, that Paraguay was, complete, was still completely devoid of civilization, and lying as it did but beyond the sphere of traffic in the commercial world, it could offer no powers of attraction to the Catholic priesthood, priesthood accustomed to the enjoyment of every description, and on this account, it was even the begging monks of the lowest grade looked upon this distant land as a kind of penal exile, having as yet but the attributes of, of a wilderness which no one could have any desire to become acquainted. During 70 years, therefore, the conversion and civilization of the Indians made but little progress in Paraguay. This is to say up to the year 1586. It then occurred to Don Francisco de Victoria, the newly appointed bishop of the province Tucumán, adjoining Chile and the whole of those extensive dioceses, there did not exist even a couple of dozen priests. <clears throat> Whether it would not be well to crave an assistance from, from them, the Society of Jesus. The want, indeed, must have been very urgent. Otherwise, Don Franciscus, who belonged himself to the Order of the Dominicans, would not certainly uh, have entrusted any such idea. Uh, be this as it may, it pleased the first bishop of Tucuma to call in the aid of the Jesuits, for the reason that by this time good service had been done by them in the neighboring states of Brazil and Peru. In the way of conversion, he at once then in the year 1586 wrote to the provincials of both the above named states, the fathers Anchitia and Atsian, who indeed at once compiled with his wishes and immediately sent to him to begin with eight members of the order, promising at the same time that more would follow if they were needed, uh, more Jesuits would follow. This was indeed hardly required as there were no or <clears throat> ordinary, ordinary fathers skilled in merely in dispute. Uh, dispensing of the sacraments and the singing of the masses, but persons who likewise understood something of what monks intended to act as missionaries had not hereto studied, namely the language of the natives concerning which much zealous attention had been bestowed in all of the Jesuit colleges of Brazil and Peru, and consequently they could come to a good understanding with the natives from the commencement. This was the foundation of a Jesuit settlement in, in this part of America. A very modest and innocent beginning, as one sees, but after a few years, both modesty and innocence were lost, an entirely different condition of affairs came into play. 
From the town of Tucumán and its provinces, the fathers visited the remaining cities on the country one after another, especially Peruda and Assumption, along with the extensive province of Guerrero, uh, Guerrero, uh, which, uh, which, which latter was selected as the sphere of duty for fathers Ortega and Fields, who were <clears throat> more especially versed in the Guyanian language. <clears throat> And, uh, and who the longer they regarded the territory, the more they were pleased with it. They tied above everything to make themselves at home in their settlement exactly the same as they had done in India, Japan, Japan and China. <clears throat> uh, it still required, however, fully three years before they obtained their first possession, then indeed, but a very modest one, so much so that it might almost be called mean, as it consisted merely of a small dwelling, dwelling house with an empty small chapel in the town of Villosuria. From this time forward, progresses, as may be said, went on at a galloping pace, and in accordance with the idea originally entertained, a large number of new members were sent to their assistance from Peru and Brazil, and among them several fathers of distinction, as for instance, Romero, Caspar de Monroe, Juan Viana, and Marcel Lorenziana. Uh, those are Jesuits. So after the lapse of two years, as may be supposed, they were able to found, they were able to found a college. This took place in the year 1593 in the city of Assumption, the capital of Paraguay, and the Spanish inhabitants of it, including the government and principal nobility, taxed themselves to such a considerable extent that they were enabled to erect a quite uh, that they were enabled to erect a quite beautiful building adjoined to the church. <clears throat> in the year 1599, this building was followed by the erection of a mission house in Cordua with the magnificent cathedral, and there was every appearance that very shortly similar establishment might also be found founded in Santa Fe as well in other towns. This, however, did not prove to be as, as the case as in the year 1602, the whole tenure of the Jesuits, uh, the whole tenure of the Jesuits in Paraguay assumed a totally new aspect. Let's see, I'll get a different photo up here, of a reduction. Here's like a map here of some Jesuit reductions in Paraguay here and in Brazil. Hey, what's up guys? Hope you're all doing well. <clears throat> so you see, up to this time, they had worked as true missionaries, and indeed, as we have seen, they had acquired here and there landed property and even built a college or a mission house, whilst they were at the same time occupied and traveling about from one district to another and from one tribe to another in order to proclaim everywhere the cross of Christ. This constant journeying backwards and forwards, however, owing to the great distances at which the settlements lay from one another, gave risk to great difficulties. Moreover, they could not reckon that the Indians, as soon as their missionaries had turned to their backs, would not revert to their heathenish practices. Consequently, it appeared evident to them that if any permanent impression was to be made among the natives, it would be necessary to give up the system of traveling about and take a permanent abode among them. Uh, this was one discovery which up to this date uh, had been made. A second consisted in this, that the Jesuits by this time had become aware of exactly how enormous the territory that went under the name of Paraguay was situated. While this still remained a secret to the Spaniards in general, beyond the couple of towns in their immediate neighboring uh, neighborhood lying on the great rivers, the latter, for instance, had not gone further into the country that is Paraguay than up the first waterfall, and they continued to be in great ignorance respecting the vast territory which lay between the Uruguay and the Parana, as well as between the latter and the Paraguay River. They had not taken the least trouble to become acquainted with, the, that is the Spanish, with the different tribes inhabiting these regions or to gain their friendship, but their whole plans had consisted in laying the se severest possible yoke upon all such nations as they had been able to subjugate and keep them on their plantations or, quote, commands. Now, these were designated in Paraguay at the most slavish work. Uh, at the most slavish work. Uh, all this, indeed, much more was known to the Jesuits operating in Paraguay, only too well, and they, of course, made an accurate report of the true state of the matters to their general in Rome. And who was he by the same Claudius Aquavia? Yeah, I'll, I'll pull up a picture of the Jesuit general while these reductions were going on. This is the Jesuit black pope here. Okay. Italian. He's the fifth superior general of the Jesuits. So, um, what was this here? Uh, so, Aquavia was a man endowed with the extraordinary mental capacity and at the same time most actively energetic, who at once devised a mode by which the greatest portion of Paraguay should fall completely into the hands of the Society of Jesus, beyond all interference from any secular power. 
This is where the Jesuits perfected communism. You see, this plan was arranged with the most infinite skill and cunning, and the carrying out of it was entrusted to no less skip, skillful individual than Father Stephen Pies, who Aquavia had dispatched to Paraguay as a visitor of all the houses of the order in the New World. Okay, uh, this is how you spell this father here who Quavia dispatched to Paraguay. Uh, I can even yeah, I can get this. Yeah, this is the guy here, Father Stephen Paez. He's here. Yeah, looks like his name is Pedro Paez. That's true. Okay. Even Pedro Paez. Okay. Um. Let's see here. Okay, so Paez and Maquavia had dispatched to Paraguay as a visitor of all the houses uh, of the order in the New World. This uh, this same father, this Paez, in the year 1602 in the town of Salta, and at once ordered all the professed Jesuits to appear before him. He then took each one of them separately to task and questioned them in regard to all details, most particularly in order that everything essential appertaining to the future organization of the order in Paraguay might be extracted. Lastly, assembling all those present, he made a long speech to them, communicating to them the orders of their general. These were to the effect, as already indicated, that a proper and distinct Christian state must be constituted in Paraguay, over which the Jesuit general in Rome should rule as absolute monarch, and in order to carry out this comprehensive idea, the work uh, each one had to do was assigned to each, the work each one had to do was assigned to him, uh, that is to each Jesuit. From this time forth, each step was taken by the Jesuits in Paraguay, uh, was most carefully considered, and when progress was but slow and often affected by very uh, by very roundabout ways, the great aim and object was to be attained. Uh, the great aim and object to be attained was never lost sight of. Above everything, it was in consequence to conciliate the natives and the Jesuit missionaries began unanimously and most zealously by se severely censoring the frightful oppression under the Indians grown, quote, the commands upon which the poor redskins work as slaves are an abomination in the sight of God, cried they, quote, and the complete extermination of the population must follow if the present system continues, end quote. Such and similar expressions aroused the hatred of the Spaniards not a little and the Jesuit fathers had in consequence during the next few years to undergo much injustice. They were indeed regularly driven out of several of the towns, such as Cordova and San Exadio, San Agio, and they won over all the more retainers among the Redskins, and they succeeded in converting and making friends of a most inconsiderable portion of the great nation of Garanas, that is, the inhabitants of uh, Gaira. Previous to the Spanish conquest, the tribe of Tubinambas Indians was by the, far the most powerful in Paraguay being distinguished at the same time for its peculiar ferocity to them indeed may be ascribed to the cruelties uh, to which intruding uh, whites were subjected. They, the Tumidabas, slaughtered their prisoners. They looked upon human flesh as the most delicious food under the sun, and they offered resistance to the death against the God of the Christian. As they came to be aware for many years of warfare that the weapons of the white man were too much for them, they arrived at the bold resolution, turning their bucks on their fatherland and at once carrying this resolution into effect, withdrew far into the wilds of the primeval forest up the broad valley of the Maroran or Amazon River to a region so distant that they hopped the pale faces and would never venture to penetrate there. Now I'm gonna go back to uh, pictures of reductions in Paraguay. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's, here's, a, this, here's a picture of like an overview of like a Jesuit reduction community here. Um, the vast plains of Paraguay, Parana, and Uruguay thus remained abandoned to the other tribes, which had hitherto been in some measure dependent on the Tumambas, uh, with the Apodias and the Cahivas and the Chachaquis and the Luz, the Frontones and the Amaguncucas. <laughs> Sorry if I'm botching these Indian tribe names. As well as before all of them, the Gairanas, who are more numerous than all the others put together. The latter fact must have directed the attention of the Jesuit missionaries to those in particular, and furthermore, they had least they had the least wild character of the various tribes of Redskins in Paraguay. On the one hand, it was founded that they were not shut from one uh, from some kind of civilization, as they lived in villages ruled over by hereditary Kazakhin or heads of clans, and existed amongst entirely upon corn and maize which they planted 
while other tribes led a nomadic life and shifted about from place to place for place to place regarding the chase as the only employment worthy of a man's consideration. On the other hand, there laid upon a reproach of the want of a warlike spirit as well as a deficiency in energy, and they tamely submitted, although filled in their inmost soul with the most intense hatred, as all over the Spanish commands they were made use of by the whites as nothing else than beasts of burden and treated accordingly. Moreover, the number of the tribe who lived in the Spanish territories was small in comparison with the vast multitude of those who inhabited the interior, and who, as I have already mentioned, remained quite unknown to the Spaniards, and it may be affirmed with certainty that fully nine-tenths of the Guyaranas had not as yet felt the burden of oppression, but the anxiety caused by the prospect before, uh, before them of soon being also subjected to this yoke induced them uh, all more favorably towards the preaching of the Jesuits against Spanish tyranny. And uh, and that that this is how like this is why I mentioned like the Jonestown like is a was a Paraguay reduction because like you're gonna see here like uh, and especially in the part two video when I read it in Nicoloni's book like the Jesuits like put the Indians into like such a state of fear because like they were fear pointing them that the Spaniard forces were gonna come invade the reduction and like rape all the women and, like kill all the children and that's exactly what Jim Jones was doing to his cult followers in Jonestown he was saying that like the American government and the like, uh, the American government, like, the British governments are going to, like, come into Jonestown and, like, shoot them all and, like, round them all up and stuff like that. It's the exact same tactic. Okay. Um, let me see here. Uh, such was the state of matters at this time in regard to the Guaranas in Paraguay when the Jesuits came to the determination of creating a government of their own and will consequently not astonish anyone as how they succeeded in procuring an entrance to Christianity. Having thus so far proceeded, they adopted the following plan of operation in the district into which at this time the Spaniards had not penetrated. They induced those who were scattered about in the small villages to unite into large communities, which were called Borgigan or reductions. That is to say, communities that had been reduced into the Christian faith, into each of these reductions were assigned two spiritual shepherds, of whom one a professed member, a long standing in the order, bore the title of a pastor or spiritual guide, the other in most instances a younger associate who had just arrived from Europe being the designated vicar. This was the arrangement, as we shall soon see, as the foundation of their Christian republic, uh, or if one would rather term it, their theocratic state. And this, had, uh, and this had such an innocent appearance that at the commencement, at least, it did not meet with any great opposition, either from the side of the Spaniards or that of the Guyaranas. The sons of Loyola represented to the Indians that several small communities, which they lay scattered about many miles apart, were ill-suited for protecting themselves against the attacks of the Spaniards. While if, on the other hand, they were collected together into the Burgaden or townships of 8,000 or 10,000 souls, they might readily keep off with ease the marauding white adventurers, and this naturally became clear to the understandings of the Redskins. They had further no reason to object to the, quote, spiritual shepherds, as the Jesuits, as they were in this way relieved from the supervision of the Kazakhan and the superiors under the title of Corregios or Aliades, and handed over to, the, handed over to that of the spiritual guides. In other words, the Indians were enabled to select for themselves their own secular magistracy, as previously, and the Jesuits merely affixed at the st uh, stipulation that in all punishments awarded by them, or in all weight weighty and important decisions, they must first of all attain the sanction of the said spiritual shepherds. Uh, and was this too much to require? So I'll get another picture up here. Um, yeah, here, look, here's a reduction here. Um, Okay, so continuing, ah, <laughs> truly the good Padres treated them in such a fatherly and remarkable kind of matter that they therefore ought to be allowed the right of father over his children. In addition to this, the Jesuits with perfect honesty represented the state of affairs to their great patron and friend Philip III, King of Spain, that is to say they explained to him in his high council for, uh, for India in several communications that the chief obstacle to the speedy and permanent extension of Christianity in Paraguay and La Plata arose entirely from the recently arrived Spaniards, being without hardly a single exception, a set of haughty, arrogant, cruel, avaricious, blasphemous, and thoroughly dissolute men. Once it happened that the natives could not do otherwise they entertain, than entertain a disgust to Christianity itself on account of the conduct of these bad Christians. Moreover, the Indians were maltreated in such a shameful manner by the royal governors and officials that on that account, a thorough hatred had sprung up against everything of Spanish origin. 
For this reason, it was if it was desired, then these poor creatures should be received into the bosom of the church. They should be equally protected from the tyranny of the governor and the bad example of the Spaniards. And these two desirata could only be accomplished by the Jesuits being permitted to carry out the long-considered plan for the creation in Paraguay of a Christian republic. Quote, and this is a quote here. Um, I think this is a quote from the Jesuits. In this said Christian republic, no secular governor may be allowed to have any control but on the other hand, the Indians belonging thereto should among themselves in, uh, in community be allowed to lead a quiet, harmonious life under the Jesuits after the manner of the early Christians so that a venerable paradisical state of innocency, innocency may be established, but in order that no injury might thereby be occasioned to the king's power, all members of the Christian Republic were bound to recognize him as their supreme lord and master, and every adult must pay to him the tribute of one dollar, end quote. Such was the upright scheme that the Jesuits suggested to the king, Philip III, as they were at the time almost all powerful at the court of Spain, that is the Jesuits. Not only was this proposition accepted by that king in the year 1609, but it also, but it was also confirmed in all of its, all of its particulars later on in the year 1649 to 1668 under the reign of Philip IV, notwithstanding that any sagious statement uh, might well see how the Spanish king's authority was by this Christian Republic in Paraguay reduced to a mere sham. That's because the Jesuits were running the show in Paraguay. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if this is a reduction here. Yeah, this looks like, yeah, this is a Paraguay Jesuit reduction here. It's like the outside of a town. Yeah, um, but at this time, the counselors of Minnesotan and the most Catholic port of the world were as of smitten in blindness, and it was only after the last of a century that the scales fell from their eyes. The first reduction, which received the holy, name, the holy name of Loreto, was situated in the confidence of the Pirip and the Piranha, and was founded in 1609 through the exertion of the Padres Masita and Caladino, who united into one small community somewhere about 30, uh, about 60 small Gairana villages, which were in existence uh, thereabouts. Next, after the Loreto reduction, came the Borgade of Saint Ignatius, and I, 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 uh, I think the postcard that or like the um the first image i put up on the screen was like an image of that saint ignatius reduction in paraguay okay. um next after loretto came the borgen and saint ignatius and subsequently a third and fourth until at length under the last of a couple of decades their number amounted to about 30 with the population of between nine and ten thousand inhabitants in each reduction the internal organization of them was was all the same that is they were governed each by a jesuit father was also supported by a vicar as his assistant and for the purpose of espionage. This father, this Jesuit father, again, was under the orders of a superior who was placed over the diocese from uh, uh, from five to six parishes. The supervision and management of these, whoever rested with the provincial residing in Assumption, who again received his orders di uh, directly from the Jesuit general in Rome. One sees then that the Jesuits did not in any way proceed to work out a plan, but that they were in possession of a Christian Republic as well, if not better regulated than the government of any secular monarch. The Indians too were not badly off with this system of administration as they were carefully educated as good citizens. Moreover, were all the act accustomed to take upon some regular empo employment. Quote, idleness is the root of all vices, end quote, thought the Jesuit fathers, the fa thought the Jesuit fathers. That is idleness is the root of all vices, and upon this principle they ruled the whole. They rule the whole of their subjects by their age or sex, what it might, and they looked to what their bodily constitution, almost as much as their aptitude and talent. Agriculture and cattle breeding naturally came first and foremost as a pursuit, and most of the adult men were thus employed in the fields. Into their hands also the elder boys were confined. To the women and girls, on the other hand, a certain quantity of flax and cotton was given out, which they had. Uh, had to spin with a certain prescribed time. Moreover, the different trades and arts uh, were not neglected, and the Jesuit chronicle upon the state of affairs regards the following words. So this is a quote here from a Jesuit in Paraguay. I'm just going to see if I can find a different photo here. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's like an old tomb in Paraguay. Uh, so I'll put this photo back up of the St. Ignatius. This, this is a quote here. It's from a Jesuit chronicle. 
quote, this is from the Jesuits, in regard to trades, we daily make further progress and our population becomes always more and more useful. After the teaching them the arts of making bricks and burning lime, we build the most beautiful churches and houses and our carpenters and glaziers know well, very well how to ornament them internally. Others spin the finest yarns and weave them, therefore the most beautiful cloths and quilts. Some again manufacture hats and employ themselves in shoemaking or any other like occupation. Even in the weaving of lace, they are expert. And this Jesuit was talking about the Indians. And when we require in particular fine and broad priestly albs, the women manufacture them after a certain pattern with such skill that no difference could be detected between the copy and the original. One man uh, made an organ after the European pattern and finished it off in such a in so perfect a manner that I was truly amazed. Another has indicted a missile so accurately after the beautiful Antover edition that the manuscript might pass for a printed copy. They manufactured trumpets also in all description of musical instruments. They make the most perfect clocks and watches for the pop, uh, watches for the pocket, and they paint them in a way that leaves nothing to be desired. In a word, they can copy anything that we desire them to do and show themselves also to be equally as teachable, and they are diligent as soon as we set them to any particular kind of work, end quote. <laughs> okay, and that was from the Jesuits book here, The History of Paraguay by Franz Xavier de Charleroi. Uh, there can, therefore, seeing all this, be no question that the Indians under the rule of the Jesuits were molded into the thoroughly capable and most useful men. In regard to this, one can certainly not withhold one's admiration from the Society of Jesus. But now comes the dark side, which to the, a, a great extent counterbalanced the bright side of the matter. The Indians, so far as concerned spiritual affairs, were kept in the degree of the most profoundest ignorance, and their religion simply consisted of the grossest superstition whereby the Jesuits represented themselves to be the oracles of God, the same deity, however, being for the white padres alone who formed the superior class of beings. And on that account, the Gairanas were obliged under severe penalty to regard the so-called, quote, superior, be the, quote, the, to quote, I apologize, superior beings, namely the Jesuits with most profound respect. So the Indians had to regard the Jesuits as superior beings. Indeed, that they were compelled to receive orders from them in a kneeling posture, and it was held and it was held to be a high honor to be allowed to kiss the sleeves or the hem of the Holy Father's garments. From such spiritual childhood, however, the Garianas uh, were never to be emancipated, and the chief means of accomplishing their th uh, thraldom was by fear and intimidation. For this reason, all the churches were ornamented with holy pictures and the most extraordinary description with the statues truly the statues of truly gigantic proportions of frightful aspect and threatening gesture. These figures also were furnished with movable limbs and rolling eyes, all of which filled the poor Indians with mortal terror and such crazy nonsense as this was called by the Jesuits Christianity. So the Jesuits like put like moving eyes and like statues and would like scare the Indians to say that like, oh, like the devil is here to like possess you and stuff like that. <laughs> as in this manner, spiritual liberty was suppressed, even so as the political and social freedom kept under sub uh, kept under subjugation. Not any one of the Jesuit subjects might for a moment think of raising himself by his talent, energy, or industry to a higher place in a social grade. And that's what communism is. Okay, everyone is the same. There's no distinction between anyone. Okay, uh, let me see here. Um, If we so, yeah, okay, I got my spot again. Not any one of the Jesuit subjects might be for a moment think of raising himself by his talent, energy, or industry to a higher place in the social grade than of his fellows, but he continued to be a mere machine in the hands of the fathers who assigned this or that employment to each according to their will and pleasure. Likewise, also there existed in the Guaranian Republic no rights of property, whatever, not even the smallest of description. No, uh, no true communism was therefore by any... Let me see here. No true communism was therefore by any means actually created. Okay. Um, because even like the, the in, even in like a communist state, like, well, like, it depends on like how extreme the communist state is, but like he, essentially like Bryson was saying there that like the Indians had, didn't even have like, they had like no personal possessions. Like it was literally like, the Jesuits uh, owned everything in Paraguay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, on the contrary, every day the uh, produce and agriculture and other industries were delivered into the hands of the Jesuits to be deposited into their storehouses, and in return for this, the Indians were merely provided with what was absolutely necessary for their daily subsistence. 
One, one might well say then that the poor subjects of the Jesuits were nothing better than slaves, and slaves truly in the fullest acceptation of the term. But this bondage was so uncommonly enveloped in sugar and exercised with such degree of fatherly benevolence that the Guaranas in their simplicity desired nothing better. And that's that, and that's kind of that's what like the mind controlled people at Jonestown people were like. Like they were so mind controlled by the Jesuit Jones that like they thought that like nothing was better than their their state of servitude. Yeah. <clears throat> Almost every evening there was a lively dance to the music. And guys, just like just like Jonestown, there was like live music every night. This this is this was in the Jesuit reductions. Almost every evening there was a lively dance to the music of a well instructed band played by the natives, and the severest labor in the field was at once lightened by the sound of trumpets and fifes taken along with them, whilst on Sundays and festivals as well in the churches, as out of them the most lively dances and plays were uh, the order of the day. So let me get another picture here. Here's a here's a remain here of a Jesuit reduction here. Uh, there was thus no lack of enjoyment, but only such a kind of amusement was permitted as was calculated to lead the Indians in a state of childhood and simplicity, and none was ever allowed by which they might develop into thinking human beings. Okay, on these very grounds, great care was never taken to allow any European to set foot in any of these Jesuit reductions, as what could more be feared than that the pestilential expose uh, which might be made by any such stranger. <laughs> so the Jesuits wanted to keep this, the realities of reductions. Uh, they wanted to hush it up to the rest of Europe. Okay, And more especially, the Spaniards were denied an entrance into these Jesuit territories. And on this account, the Indians were encouraged to resist by force any attempted intrusion of such visitors. That is to say, all such were turned out of the dom domain by strength of arms. Thus, Garianas, with all alarcity, rendered implicit obedience to such appeals as were made to them of this nature, as the Jesuits has instilled the belief into their minds that the Spanish only came there to take possession of their territories and to exact the same statue of labor for them by which so many thousands of their brethren had been destroyed owing to overwork. To prevent effectually, however, the approach of any stranger amongst the Garianas, the only language which was taught in their schools was the Gariana, and by this means of comprehension of all other tongues was nippled into the bud. Indeed, the Jesuits even went so far as to form in every reduc reduction or borough an armed force consisting of cavalry as well as infantry, and by means of these troops, well armed and drilled as they were, besides being also provided with artillery, they could easily get the better of any foreign attempt at instruction even when made by force without the boundaries of this Christian Republic in Paraguay. They soon indeed succeeded in extending even their own original domains far across the borders of the province of Gaira, so that in a short time their possessions comprehended all the countries to the right and left of Paraguay, even as far as Brazil, but no information nor at least very uncertain news respecting their enormous possessions was allowed to reach Europe, as the country was, so to speak, hermetically sealed, and even the court of Madrid, although the king was recognized by them, as the nominal Lord Paramount of Paraguay was kept in ignorance of all details concerning the proceeds of the Jesuits. I say empathetically nominal, nominal as never from the year 1609 up to the middle of this 18th century had the king exercised any kind of authority whatsoever in that republic that is Paraguay. And even the head money that the Jesuits had contracted to pay annually to the kings of Spain came in so sparingly that it might be well supposed to have derived from only some 30 or 40,000 subjects instead of from at least 10 times that number. Still notwithstanding the excessive power to which the order of Jesus attained in the South Americas, and even in the unbounded dominion that pleased the general of the Jesuits in Rome on a par with the mightiest monarchs of the world, the reader will learn from the fourth and fifth sixth books of this work the principal causes which led to the downfall of this much dreaded society of these parts of the globe. Thus much of the Jesuit missions on the distant regions of the world are rather concerning the gigantic growth of the Society of Jesus in Asia, Africa, and America. And in, the, in part three of this video, I'm going to read to you from this book, the story of Marcus de Pombal in Portugal and his story of the Jesuit reductions in Paraguay were one of the main reasons for Pombal uh, banning the Jesuits out of Portugal. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, so this is uh, this is continuing from the history of the Jesuits by Theodore Greisinger. I'm just going to give you some. He goes into some of the Jesuit commerce that was done in Paraguay. Okay. Um, 
So this is page 422. There could not, there could not, however, be in the slightest doubt that the prophet was something enormous, as their dominion of Paraguay alone, that is the Jesuits, gave them annually over four million of ducats, four millions of ducats, and it is shown by an official report of the Portuguese governor general of the town of Pozoi, Don Malfia de Angelos Gorteri, written in the year 1731. The said governor, who had received from his government orders to make the most minute investigation of all sides, found the country Portugal to be divided into 36 parishes or reductions, and each of these comprehended in itself in 10,000 families. In all of them, however, there existed such a great surplus of stones, uh, stores, and produce, pro produce that a single reduction was alone in condition to supp uh, supply six others for the whole year. Even the smallest of their reduct the Jesuit reductions produced uh, their 40,000 or 50,000 head of oxen and, uh, and cows, and the larger and richer Jesuit reductions of them, not less than double that quantity. So I'll get another picture up here. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a map here of Jesuit reductions. Yeah, right here. Yeah, uh, here's one here. Well, this is the expulsion of the Jesuits from St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, let's see here. Yeah, here's looks like here's an entr entrance to a Jesuit reduction here in Paraguay. Yeah. Uh, in consequence of this, the Jesuits were enabled to export yearly to Spain about 300,000 hides of cattle, each of which was sold for six paestres or more, and the trade in leather brought even as much. The fields proved to be very productive, and all kinds of grain were grown upon them as well as especially as tobacco, sugar, and cotton, which latter the Indian women were required to spin and weave. All these articles were likewise transported to Europe and cotton stuffs were alone yielded, or cotton stuffs were to alone yielded an annual profit of 100,000 heavy paestres. Everywhere, uh, everywhere to be observed, well-appointed workshops and the Indians manufactured their most beautiful gold and civil wares. Moreover, there were numbers of locksmith shops and forges and foundries uh, and were not wanting in which cannon, mortars, and the like might be cast. However, the latter manufacturers, uh, manufacturers were designed not so much for the trade uh, trade as for internal use, and the same remark as also holds good as the manufacturers of arms. As a particularly extensive commerce took place, on the other hand, of the so-called Paraguay herb, and as there was a sale for it almost all over the world, it indeed brought a profit which was certainly as great as the gold and silver mines in the other American countries. In short, the Jesuits derived from their trade in Paraguay truly immense sums, and the, these were mere, these were dutifully taken into keeping by the Spanish superiors of the mission. Every six years, however, the general procurators came into the provinces and sent the proceeds to Rome, either in bills of exchange or wares. It was also to be marked that in every parish or reduction, considerable storehouses existed in which the wares and the land produce were stored until they could be conveyed to the great marketplaces of Santa Fe, Buenos Aires, and Tacumen either for sale or for exportation. And from this, it will be seen how exceedingly well the Jesuits understood the draining of their dominion in Paraguay. Okay. So thus did the Don Martha Angelos Gortere report mentioned earlier concerning the Jesuits in Paraguay, the official report from the government of Paraguay in 1731. And he calculated as already remarked the amount of their commercial trade at even more than 10 millions of hard dollars. That's in 1731. Okay, so there's been like 10,000 time percent inflation since then okay <laughs> while he at the same time added that the maintenance of the indians cost i mean their eating drinking and clothing made a slight deduction not the net not the less magnificently did the jesuits come out by degrees in mexico through their intrigues and that the equally honest and truthful unfortunate archbishop in mexico and viceroy of spanish america so severely persecuted by the jesuits don juan de palafox submitted a copious report uh, to the or subject or the subject of Pope Innocent X. In this document, among other things, the following statements are made. And this is a interesting report here. I'm going to finish the video soon because I don't want it to run on too long. Okay, but uh, okay, here it is. Here, okay, this is the this is the report here, coming from um, Juan, uh, Don Juan de Palafix. This is a report he said. Politics submitted to Pope Innocent X. Uh, I find almost the whole wealth of Central America in the hands of the Jesuits and the property they hold in herds of cattle and sheep is something truly enormous. Thus I am acquainted with two of their colleges, each of which numbers 300,000 sheep and another commands more than 60,000 oxen and their passages. 
whilst the secular clergy together with all other religious orders have only three sugar refineries and those very small the Jesuits possess, possess in the province of Mexico alone, in which they have no fewer than 10 colleges, the six largest manufacturers uh, that there are throughout the whole of Central America, and each of them represents a value from half to a whole million dollars. Indeed, some of them bring an annual net profit of more than $100,000, and this is in like 1730. Moreover, they also possess tracts of land which frequently extend for several miles in these territories, which they farm as they belong to the most productive regions, bring them, the Jesuits, an immense quantity of maize, tobacco, and other produce. Also, very rich silver mines belong to their, their Jesuit colleges, and they have succeeded in a word to bring such a height to their power and riches that secular clergy will soon be compelled to beg their bread from the Jesuits. <laughs> You see here, thus did Palafox write in his statements were only too amply confirmed by, by from other quarters. Yeah. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna end the video there. Um, there's one more interesting quote I want to read to you from Francis Spellman's book, The American Pope. Okay. Actually, here yeah, here's some good photos of Jesuit reductions here. Yeah, here's a photo of a Jesuit reduction. You see, here, the Indians lived in like complete poverty and like uh, slavery. The Jesuits just gave them enough just to barely survive. Yeah, they completely mind controlled the Indians. Yeah. I'm sure this was uh this is just interesting. Uh, this is from the American Pope, uh, the, the biography of Francis Spellman. We know Francis Spellman was initiated into the Jesuit Illuminati. Uh, Spellman was uh, behind so many intrigues in the Cold War, the war in Vietnam, uh, World War II. Spellman was like the official vicar of the American Armed Forces. He was. Spellman was Jesuit educated at Fordham University. This is from page 223. Um, on another trip, Spellman landed in Paraguay where he warmly greeted the dictator Alfredo Storenzie. So Cardinal Spellman's greeting the dictator of Paraguay in uh, 1955, Alfredo Storenzie, who had recently effected a military coup, unlike the military dictatorships in Brazil and Chile that um, Paid that unlike the military dictatorships in Brazil and Chile that at least paid lip service to helping the people, Strosner made no pretenses. His military and police were rewarded with the graft, contraband, and the spoils of lucrative narcotics and prostitution trades. Upon his arrival, Cardinal Spellman went to the general's residence where he publicly proclaimed what a pleasure it was to be in, quote, the ancient Catholic country of, of Paraguay, end quote. That's what Cardinal Spellman said. Cardinal Spellman said it was an honor to be in the ancient Catholic country of Paraguay, the Catholic dicta uh, Paraguayan dictator Stroessner, who desired just such a blessing from his regime, thanked the cardinal profusely. Let me see if I can get a picture of this guy with Cardinal Spellman. This is the guy here. This is the dictator that Spellman met in Paraguay, Alfred Stroessner. Here he is, former president of Paraguay. Let's see if you can get a photo of him with Cardinal Spellman. I don't know if you can see a photo of them together, but Spellman met this uh, Stroyser in Paraguay, and, S and Spellman said that he was pleased to be in the ancient land of Paraguay. Why did Spellman, the Jesuit servant of the Jesuits, educated form at Fordham, say that Paraguay is an ancient Catholic country? Because that's where the Jesuits placed their roots of communism. That's where they created the political system of communism, was in Paraguay. So that's why it goes back to the ancient roots. Okay. Yeah, that's all for this one, YouTube. I'm going to do more parts of this video. Hope you enjoyed, but uh, take care and namaste.